many things we care about are hard to see, and this is particularly the case with issues of sustainability. Agricultural pesticide use, forest practices in remote, distant locations, industrial emissions from disparate industrial facilities or from the tailpipe of vehicles. Each of these situations are activities that we benefit from in society, goods and services that we consume, but also those invisible things can cause harm to the environment or society. A lot of my work looks at governance efforts that try to marry sustainability responsibility rules with assurance processes to ensure that those invisible attributes are being appropriately generated or managed or measured such that we can be assured in society that emissions are reducing, fishing practices are being done responsibly, harvesting activities are taking account of ecosystems, water quality, and these kinds of challenges interestingly, have a lot of translation to lots of different contexts in society, including the uptake recently in artificial intelligence, where there's a lot of attention to safety and responsibility of the AI systems that are being developed. And often, some of the challenges there are things to do with their invisible attributes as well, things that we don't know about in terms of how the data was trained, or how the applications are gonna work in practice when they're deployed and they're no longer uh, under the control of the original designers or engineers. So in many of these cases, we can learn lessons from different cases to understand how we can better govern those kinds of invisible things to ensure that we maximize the benefits of these kinds of activities while also minimizing and reducing those harms that can come with them, including disproportionate negative effects on certain communities, harm to the environment, et cetera. Everyone has a story to tell. In my lab, we're exploring new ways to help others create content for virtual and augmented reality, allowing more diverse communities to participate in immersive storytelling. Immersive technologies such as augmented and virtual reality afford unique ways to connect audiences with stories in ways that we've never been able to do in the past. In the last five years, immersive technologies like VR headsets have become more affordable and we've seen a boom in VR social content and gaming content. However, the ability to create such content still remains in the hands of technologists. Our goal is to find new and innovative ways to help everyone share their stories via immersive technologies. This includes things like new design methodologies that support collaboration and co-design, to new tools and technologies that make the design process much more accessible to everyone so that diverse communities can share their stories in immersive technologies. Does state secrecy have a history? I think it does. And to explore this history, I look at declassification within the federal policies of the United States. It's a history that begins in 1945 with the Manhattan Project. I find declassification fascinating for at least two reasons. First, it raises questions about the role that time plays in organizing and legitimating state secrecy. Second, declassification often goes hand in hand with redaction. Images of redacted text are commonplace in media and in art. But what is this curious, fragmented, pixelated image, this form of communication? Not just a source of data or a form of scandalous revelation, but a way to write the history of state secrecy. LEARN is the Local Engagement Refugee Research Network. We're a partnership of researchers and practitioners in East Africa, in the Middle East, here in Canada. We're working to understand and enhance the role of civil society in the functioning of the global refugee regime through research, through training, through knowledge translation and mobilization. We're trying to amplify the perspectives of those closest to the perspective of displacement to make policy and practice more responsive to the needs of refugees to ensure that our understanding of the phenomenon of displacement is better informed by the perspective of those who know it best.
I've created a course on trauma-informed reporting at the School of Journalism, and we're using actors to conduct simulations so that students get an opportunity to interview someone who is portraying what it might be like to have survived something traumatic. So students can practice these skills and the storytelling involved and the sensitivity needed to interview someone in uh, this context without the pressure of doing that in a real life news environment. So we're bringing that simulation exercise, we're bringing those skills that students need in the real world into the classroom so that that's the place where they can practice these skills that they need in a safer, uh, constructive environment.